On today's world inside, a price setback for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies after an electric car maker stopped accepting them, a temporary blip or the start of a bandwagon, and a powerful picture telling a story that's worth remembering. That's the mission of ace photographer Platon. If I can use stories to bring people back together, then I'm happy to be in front of the camera temporarily. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. China votes to a cash-free future with rollout of a digital currency. The digital yuan is expected to make a splash on the ice at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. But China is not alone in pushing state-regulated digital currencies as the emergence of private cryptocurrencies pose a growing threat to national security, some say. Unlike cryptocurrencies, the digital yuan is centrally controlled with greater transparency on real-time transaction. So what are the challenges and benefits of embracing a digital currency? What's in store for China's digital RMB? Let's loop in our panelists. For the latest on the China digital currency in San Francisco, we have Dr. Linda Kreitzman, Assistant Dean and Executive Director of the world's number one financial engineering program at the University of California at Berkeley. Jeffrey Townsend, Head of the Research with Asia Tech Strategy in Hong Kong. Hong Hao, Managing Director and Head of Research at Volcom International. Last but not least, in Beijing, Chu Qiang, Assistant Director from the International Monetary Institute at Renmin University of China. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to have you. Go to you first, uh, uh, Dr. Kreitzman. The latest about the Chinese digital currency, is it exciting to you? Well, everything that is blockchain and crypto is very exciting to me. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm, and first of all, thank you for having me Great to have uh, you for here. two reasons. This is my first time with you, but also uh, I'm passionate about cryptocurrency and blockchain for many, many years. Mm. So what is exciting to you about the China digital currency? Um, I have to say that when I um, anything that is digital for me means that uh, it is going to be, um, you know, fewer transaction costs It's going to be faster execution of uh, transactions. This is what happens with, you know, any uh, digital currency. Um, I uh, believe, unlike Elon Musk, that it is also environmental friendly. So everything uh, to me is, um, you know, more efficient and um, yeah. more exciting. Mm. 500,000 uh, uh, Chinese are likely to test the digital currency at beginning from April. We've already seen it being tested in some uh, uh, cities uh, uh, across China. Mr. Hong, what do you think about the result? Um, well, it's still on the trial stage, uh, yes. mostly uh, in Shenzhen and some other tier one cities. But as you know, um, in many of the Chinese cities, um, e-payment now is being done through uh, uh, WeChat and also through uh, Alipay. Uh, so, you know, it's a difficult inroad for the digital currency uh, to make. Uh, but I think now, you know, because it's a, a top-down mandate, uh, and I think many of the banks, in, in, including my bank, is pushing uh, towards a wider uh, adaption of the digital currency. How wide uh, an adaption are you talking about so far? Uh, I would say, you know, in terms of the payment uh, volume, transaction volume, it's less than 1%. It is still at a it very It is less than stage. 1%, you say? I would say so, yes. Okay. You know, because you have, a, you have a working existing system that is working very, very well. I think the new system requires you to go into the bank and exchange your currency into uh, digital currency and then install some apps and so that you can use it. Uh, and there's not that many places actually accept this 
form of currency. And that's why you know, it's a, a slow inroad for now. Yeah, we see the China digital currency being tested here and there, for example, at the just concluded China First the International Consumers Expo at some uh, tier one uh, uh, Chinese cities, but small amount, you know, people can download an app, get on it, got 50 kwai, at some kinds of China digital currency equivalent, and they can spend that with discount in uh, certain stores. Uh, we see people quite enthusiastic about it, but Mr. Towson, tell me more about your take on that. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon because China is particularly well known for speed of adoption, both at scale and just, just speed outright. There's a lot of enthusiasm uh, for anything digital, anything with a QR code seems to go. But that's always been sort of a <laughs> that's a nice analysis you just give. Oh, mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, it, I mean, it's usually driven by consumers, and then businesses are forced to follow what the consumers want. That's kind of been the pattern. Mm. Well, I mean, this one's a little different because every consumer is already doing mobile payment. Yeah, I mean, we're all doing it. So this one is sort of interesting that it's coming down, sort of top down. Um, and, you know, I, I can't think of another situation like this. Now, I suspect it's going to happen. I just don't think we're going to see sort of the surprising speed we've seen with, you know, mobile payment, bicycles mm. on the streets, all of that stuff. So right. it's probably slower than what we're used to. Everybody has been talking about this top-down approach uh, when it comes to China's digital currency. Mr. Chu, uh, what is your take about that nature? Uh, do you see it as that nature? Oh, yeah, it's a top-down way of doing this. Well, a lot of people have lots of imagination, wild imagination about the DCEP or digital RMB. But actually, you just consider it as one of the uh, e version of the paper money nothing different. Well, and when you use it, experience will be quite the same like what you're doing now with your Alipay or PayPal. Oh, Mr. Telson just mentioned, uh, well, uh, he's excited about, um, you know, spending all these uh, electric money in China using it for the tax waiving, using for bicycles. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to know something behind that is that, uh, you know, we have Babel Street, which is a uh, banking code for all the banks all over the world. We need regulations to, to do the anti-money laundry or other illegal issues. Right. So basically, if you want to uh, spend some money in a country uh, electronically, you need to open up a bank account. Otherwise, you wouldn't register your uh, e-wallet in your mobile phone. Mm. But Chinese government want to help foreign friends. When they come to Beijing for the expo, for the Winter Olympics, right. they need to use their e-wallet. They cannot register a bank account because they cannot stay in China for enough long time. Right. So we developed this DCEP system, allow them to register a temporary e-wallet with the regulation framework of the Babel Street by registering with the central bank system. And then they can use it in China with they stay in China. Right. So this is like the perfect solution for this problem. But it needs to be pushed down from the top to the bottom. Otherwise, we're going to see a lot of loopholes by falling use it, folly use it um, to commit a lot of other mistakes. So I think this is by far the best solution we have. Mm. Uh, Mr. Honghao earlier was holding his uh, coffee. It looks like great coffee. You know, that's exactly what I did when I used the digital currency at the uh, first uh, China International Consumer Products Expo. In fact, I only got the money enough to buy a coffee. Uh, that's that's all I have <laughs> uh, when it comes to digital currency. But, you know, having said that, though, it is not just about the convenience, is it? I mean, it's also about the competition. Uh, maybe it's some kind of cooperation among nation states. You never know. Uh, for example, now we see China's digital currency. We also see, you know, Facebook-based uh, uh, digital currency earlier called uh, earlier name has been even changed to, to, to DM today, and it's uh, likely to be operated within the United States. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hong, uh, how do you see this uh, nation state uh, uh, behind all of the digital currency uh, testing, and what does it mean for the nature of these currencies? Yeah, well, I think what China is doing differently is that it's a central bank issue digital currency. Uh, so, you know, the other forms of payment system that you mentioned just now is actually done, you know, via private companies, you know, which are very different nature. And I think more likely than not, you know, even though it's a very slow startup, 
um, I think you know somewhere down the road, you know, central bank the PBOC is going to achieve its result uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the end. So I think at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a very transparent payment system. In this system, it's very difficult to do tax evasion, right? Because every transaction you've done is recorded uh, on the system. Uh, so I think compared to, for example, some of the other cryptocurrencies that we, you know, now is is, is um, at its a uh, a very heated stage. Uh, the central bank digital currency is a centralized, top-down sort of a mandate, yeah. while you know the other ones represent a a trend of decentralization. Mm. What does that mean for the geopolitical competition, even, Mr. Hong? Briefly. Um, well, I would say that um, the future is already here. Um, I think mm -hmm. we've witnessed uh, an electronic payment uh, system evolve across the past decade. And I think now we get to a stage where you know the uh, uh, the uh, central bank currency uh, can be digitalized as well. And I think you know by doing so, you know you, you enable faster transaction across the board. And also you know you know if you're doing cross border um, industrial commodity purchasing, for uh -huh. example, um, um, or purchasing from Russia, for example, then you can actually bypass the U.S. system by you know, using the digital currency. That makes the Washington very worried, isn't it, Dr. Kreitzman? We see that debate already going on at the Capitol Hill and beyond. Uh, how do you see the geopolitical connotations in this uh, development of uh, digital currency? Well, I, I think when you have a digital currency that is done by a government, it means that there is more and more adoption of uh, you know, digital currency and then cryptocurrency. So I, I think there's going to be some sort of competition uh, among, you know, which we see uh, even in uh, in the U.S., for instance, um, you know, between Bitcoin and we see what, what happened with Bitcoin yesterday. And maybe yes. that means that the consumer might shift more to ETH, to Ethereum. Um, so you know, um, I have to say that I am not an expert in uh, in what is uh, happening in China. Mm. Um, but um, you know, how strong do you think is the desire, for example, from Washington or from the industries, about developing the U.S. version digital currency? How is uh, how do you, you know, insider inside the U.S. Uh, now looking at China's trend? You know, just from public information and to look at what you have back at home and think about what the future might be. Well, well first of all, we all we already have some stable coins, right? So yes. um, I, I think the U.S. is going stable to be Stable coin is, uh, is pegged to the dollar, just for those information, That's those correct. who do not it know. Yeah. It's one-on-one -on -one pegged to the dollar, yeah. That's correct, as is DAI pegged to the dollar. Um, you know, I, I think we... Uh, we have a government who is looking, the SEC is also looking at, you know, digital currency. Um, you know, a few years ago, we were not sure that we would do that, but I think we're working toward a wider adoption. And uh, if China is doing it, the other countries are going to have to do it. Mm. And certainly the U.S. will as well. Mm. Central banks have always been uh, critical about digital currency, China included. Uh, uh, there were a lot of discussions about the pros and cons about this over the past uh, a year or two. Uh, and now it seems that China is moving in that direction. Your take, Mr. Towson? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch how China has done this because it was on the table for a long time. And it was, you know, five years, and then just cool. in the last couple of years, it really accelerated, right? It was sort of moving slowly, and then it really took off, and you kind of wonder if, what that was in reaction to or if it's just the way things work. What do you think? But certainly, the pace in the last year has been impressive. I mean, there are trials. It's rolling out in cities. We mm -hmm. see it in businesses. So, you know, it went from being an interesting project to, okay, it's happening, and it's happening pretty much right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that makes China somewhat unique. Mr. Chu, um, is China looking at geopolitics when China is uh, pushing forward uh, with bigger speed, uh, with faster speed uh, when it comes to digital currency? No, not at all. That's mm. my answer. Um, Tell me more. I think, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a, I, think I, I have the honor and uh, the luck to be a part of this uh, initiative since China just uh, tried to launch this pilot program. Uh, so. Uh, 
to my knowledge, it's quite clear from the top in the central bank, uh, we didn't allow in the very beginning the use of the cross-border of these digital RMB. Uh, it's been stipulated very, very clear that the digital RMB should be used always inside the border of the Chinese territory. Uh, we will have the IP address restrictions. We will have the what we call the uh, um, you know the GPS screen net to prevent that people outside the border of China to use uh, the digital currency. So a lot of people will have a lot of imaginations about do we use the Chinese currencies uh, you know, flying back and forth uh, outside and inside the border of China. So we can you know jump over a lot of restrictions and buy things without being noticed by other trading partners. Um, but that's just an imagination. Mm. To be very honest, we didn't plan it in the very beginning. And um, this is just trying to help China to, you know, to polish our current cash systems, you know, anti-money laundry, tax evasion. That's a bigger problem than foreign trade. And, um, and a lot of underground economy need to be bashed. And also letting alone, like I mentioned, a lot of foreign friends come to China more and more. They want to spend the e-money, but they don't have a bank account. Yeah. And we cannot abolish our banking code, so we have this uh, solution. Mm. And that's all the uh, you know purpose of having this. So no things about geopolitical competition. Mm. What about uh, the DM uh, and also the fact that it was earlier thinking about you know having an operation based in Switzerland now. With the Congress pressure, uh, Facebook moved it back to the United States. Even the name changed. Uh, Dr. Kreitzman, uh, what do you make of uh, the, you know, the political and geopolitical connotation behind all of these decisions? Um, well, to me, I'm, I'm going to repeat the same thing. Uh, I think all the countries are doing the same thing. They are looking at, uh, you know, um, digital money, what to do with it, and yeah. they are slowly but surely entering that field. Um, and everyone is looking at what each, what other country is doing. All right, Dr. Kreitzman. Uh, not only the countries, you know, the nation states, but also the, the central banks, and, but also the industries, and also, uh, you know, some of the new kids on the block, quote unquote, that are already very mature. For example, the DM that we talked about. Uh, for example, Elon Musk's support of uh, the Bitcoin uh, that we have seen the drama over the past few days. How do you see, you know, digital currency on the one hand and the market is looking at others? Uh, what going to be the uh, interactions between these two very different systems? Uh, is there going to be current uh, chemistry or is there going to be huge competition uh, instead? Uh, Mr. Chelson. Well, I mean, from my perspective, I would as a let's say an American, I would say it's some much needed competition. Yeah. Uh, given the printing extravaganza happening in Washington, D.C. and the devaluing of the U.S. currency, uh, I think there are a lot of people who are looking not necessarily for a new payment mechanism, but for somewhere to store their money. Um, you know, that may be the biggest factor mm -hmm. for a lot of people. So, yeah, I, I am quite pleased to see some competition um, I that's see. overdue. Mr. Holm? Likewise. Yeah, well, I would say um, the technology um, has a lot to be uh, learned from uh, the cryptocurrencies, which, you know, enhance the security of the payment system. But then at the same time, you know, because the cryptocurrency is grown within a sort of a larger sovereign framework where the central bank is, you know, the, the main issue of, of paper currency and then later on the digital currency. I so I don't think they are necessarily compatible, you know, the two. So I think now, you know, the central bank currency is the, uh, the legitimate currency, the digital currency, legitimate digital currency. But then the cryptocurrency is sort of a still a largely a speculative instrument. You know, yeah. you can't use it to, to pay for, you know, for, for your daily life, for mm. example. Uh, so I think for now, it is a storage of value, and I think it is a sort of an uh, anti-fragile instrument, you know, towards a, a, a leverage money printing system uh, in the U.S., but then at the same time, it is not really a payment uh, system Yes. Uh, because you can't even pay for your life. Dr. Kreisman? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, well, I would tend to uh, uh, agree that it is a store of value. It's also very volatile. But at the end of the day, there is a demand for this from uh, not just young people, but uh, yes, you 
Um, and, and I see that no matter what Elon said the last, uh, you know, two days, it's, I don't believe that it, uh, it's, there's going to be an impact on uh, even the demand for Bitcoin. Um, you know, yes, again, there might be a switch to something else, so ETH, but, uh, you know, how often mm -hmm. have we seen for the last few years, is it the end of a Bitcoin on the headlines all the time? Um, it hasn't changed. Um, so, um, I, to me, I think that we are moving toward that. Let's not even forget that you have companies or hedge funds uh, who are creating crypto teams right now, Millennium, um, and uh, 0.72, they are six months, yes. you know, uh, away from uh, uh, creating a crypto fund. Um, everything points to a wider adoption. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I see a, a coexistence, you know, fiat money, but also, you know, crypto money. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think in the next few days, we'll probably see the demand for Bitcoin go up again. I don't know what was in Elon Musk's uh, mind, but uh, clearly <laughs> to me, I think it's pure hypocrisy mm. because uh, he uses or burns a lot of fuel right. to send his rocket into space. Uh, but uh, again, you know, for his uh, um, Tesla, okay. perhaps he was concerned that uh, people wouldn't buy his uh, Tesla. Uh, the Teslas, right? Um, those who are environmental friendly. Um, so again, uh, I see this as a very a better efficient market. I, I think um, indeed we printed quite a bit of money in the United States and, and in some countries, um, if you're in Turkey, for instance, uh, where you can see uh, you know, the, the money All right. um, not be worth anything. I think you know, crypto is, is is going to be the you know an explosion. Um, it's going to be adopted widely. We will never be able to read the, what is going on in the mind of uh, Elon Musk, but maybe that is uh, less relevant uh, right now. Uh, though he has always been one interesting figure related to uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Mr. Chu, final words. Final words is I used to own my first Bitcoin in 2013, my <laughs> first Dalby in 2015, yeah. my first Ethereum in 2017, and everything I've been tried before. Well, what I mentioned is that, one mention is that it's not a, it's not just a competition. It's more like a fighting against each other, the private coinage against the fiat money. Well, basically, the government, like Mr. Telson's mentioned, is in a printing a frenzy. But people want to provide, uh, prevent their, you know, own money from being losing so what can they do people are trying different ways but uh, i'm not saying they are the perfect ways okay. no matter bitcoin with some value or the dog is don't have so much value just people are trying so i'm glad human beings are trying to find out another better way of payment and storage of value but uh, we're far uh -huh. we're far you know before we can reach that point all right so let's just say and we should wait and see well i think it's always uh uh, recommendable the wait and see attitude but investors are already jumping in uh, having said that though we are wrapping up today's conversation thank you so much every one of you for your contribution Linda Kreitzman Jeffrey Townsend Hong Hao Chu Chang really appreciate it thank you that's my earlier conversation with a panel of experts on digital currency you're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Coming up in the program, a powerful picture telling a story that's worth remembering. That's the mission of ace photographer Platinum. We will catch up with him after the break. Stick around. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Now let's turn to photography. The lensman Platinum has been a creative force through his prolific and vivid pictures. He has captured portraits of the most famous and powerful people on the planet, Bill Clinton, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, and many others. How does he tear down the personal barriers his subjects put up in front of the camera? I had the chance to catch up with him, and we talked about taking pictures of big names and how to make photography really authentic. Take a listen. For more, joining us from New York, a Platon, a photographer, human rights activist, and a storyteller. What a pleasure to see you. It's great to see you too. 
You know, this is the guy behind the scenes taking photo of everyone, all those important moments. But now we can see you, the guy behind the scenes. That's really something. I'm a storyteller and I care deeply about, uh, at this time of global division, I care deeply about people coming together, working together, connecting and bridge building. And, and I think as we rebuild the new world, I think we have to rebuild with a different mindset. And so if I can use stories to bring people back together, then I'm happy to be in front of the camera temporarily. I thought I was just talking to a photographer. Apparently it's not. It's someone who has been thinking about where we are a lot. I'm very impressed, Platon. Tell me more well, about some of the latest photos you did. You know, he, here's the thing. Um, we were all moving so fast mm -hmm. before. Most of us were not spending enough time with our loved ones or our family because we were distracted by technology. I've seen people at dinner on a date and they're both on their cell phones texting other people while they're in front of each other. Yeah. Um, this is what was happening to society. COVID has, has given the world an opportunity to reset. It's really important that we stop and think. And uh, we talk to ourselves yes. and we say, you know, how can I rank myself? How can I measure my contribution to the world? And was it really all about success, um, money, fame, validation? Mm -hmm. Or is it possible that we could rethink about what success is and think of ourselves as servants of society? For me, success is being able to bridge, uh, to, to create a bridge between people that didn't really communicate. Right. If, if, you, if I can use my work to bring people together, and m even more importantly than that, to amplify voices that have been previously unheard, I think that's really important. I photographed the most powerful people in the world, and I became known as the photographer of power. Mm -hmm. I think they tell me that I photographed more world leaders than anyone in history in a private sitting. Um, so I've seen it up close. And, and very personal, you know, I mean, yeah. it's like going to the dentist, you know, you, you, it's intimate, you know, I was an inch and a half away from Putin's nose as I focused my camera. Mm -hmm. So you feel his breath on your hand when you're working in that intimate way and you right. get close to someone. Um, but I've also had the great privilege in life to photograph people who have been robbed of power and people who care deeply about human rights and people who have made great sacrifices for the sake of others mm -hmm. and so i've seen both sides of the spectrum yeah and it's a it's a very strange perspective to have you know to, yeah. to be able to go to the top of the power pyramid right and then go all the way to the people who have not been heard at the base yeah so it's a it's a great privilege to have that perspective i i love that idea you know over the years, some of the works that artists might be most proud of at the moment they made it may not necessarily the works that would always meandering in their mind years later. It really depends on where they are, what their stage of life is, and how the world has been changing. Is that true also for you, Platon? I know you've been doing enormous amount of work. What you said is actually very true. You can take, I can take a picture picture stays the same, but history changes around it. I love that. I can't change anything, and I, I don't want to make you think that the person I photographed is a good person or a bad person. Mm. My job is not to judge. My job is to capture. Yes. It's for society, and it's actually for history to judge. It's their legacy that will tell us whether they did good or bad. Mm. So I'm powerless in that, and I have no interest in that. If I can capture someone's spirit in that 500th of a second, um, then it's, it's there for society. It's there to cure society's amnesia, to remind society that this person was there and this is what they were like. In the media today, everyone is fascinated by making judgments. Mm. And 
I never wanted to do that. You know, I've been briefed by so many editors in the past when they would say, you're about to photograph this young politician. We really like that guy, so mm -hmm. make him smile. And I would always say, you know what? That <laughs> might not be the person I meet. Yeah, you know, he exactly. He might not be in a good mood. And so I always try to be true um, to the moment. And at the time, it might not fit with everyone's idea of um, the, the media persona yeah. of that person. But it's quite extraordinary how many times I caught a true moment and 20 years later or 10 years later, we look back at history mm. and that moment really means something and you can see it. This is um, what I want so to learn, Platon. I mean, journalism, uh, you know, people do work like me. I want to learn some secrets from you. You know, how would you bring that moment out? What are some there of is, your secret weapons? There is a, there's a magic, <laughs> it's not a trick and I wish there was a trick. Yeah. And I wish there was a gimmick, but there is no gimmick. The truth is about being honest and sincere and authentic. Because we all constantly, especially when we're in a professional environment, uh, we all put on an act. We all have a business card that says we're a bit more powerful than we are actually in mm -hmm. real life. And we all have social media accounts where we try to pretend we're actually cooler than we really are. Mm -hmm. And we all secretly want validation. Um, that's, that's, that's the currency of society. But um, the honest truth is that when you're with someone, you can't allow power to ever intimidate you. I always have a healthy disregard for power. I'm not disrespectful when I work with anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I treat everyone the same, whether it's the president of Russia or whether it's a homeless person in New York. Now, if you can dare to be authentic with people, it takes a bit of courage because we're all scared to tell the truth. But if you dare to tell the truth, it sets the most magical tone of mm -hmm. honesty between you and your sitter. Yeah. I'm just looking to capture them at a quiet moment of authenticity mm. when someone is 150% themselves. If I can get to that magical moment, then message delivered and understood. Platon, if I ask you, you know, after photography, almost everyone so-called in the high political office and the so-called dignitaries of the world, what is on your desired list? I have, a, I have not had an opportunity to photograph Queen Elizabeth II. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told by the palace I'm on the list, but I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> when I was younger, I used to think, okay, the powerful people are over there. If I can go over there, uh, I'll be in with the powerful people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that will give me some kind of validation. Um, but as time went on, I started to realize that, and this is a message to everybody, it's, it's not just a conversation between you and me. It's not over there where the powerful people are, where I need to be to be validated. Yes. Wherever I am, if I believe in the moment, it will become a moment. And I've proved that to myself many times that I photographed so many people who are not famous, who are not powerful, but if I yeah. invest my energies into that moment with that person and treat them with the, with the respect and the dignity that they really deserve, that moment can become much more historic than if I'm working with a world leader. Yeah, tell me because one or two of those in, moments. In, um, in America for years, this is not just talking about Donald Trump, this is before Trump, we've had a huge problem with immigration and our immigration laws. Yeah and uh, it's caused a lot of cultural friction as well as political friction in our country. So um, I thought it would be interesting during Obama's presidency to try and investigate the human side of uh, the immigration problems. Mm -hmm. And one day I was at a march, uh, 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 it was a pro-immigration reform march, so mm -hmm. people were marching to change the broken law. Right. Uh, and there was this mother marching with her little girl, whose, whose name was Evelyn, and she was about three years old. 
and they uh, Evelyn was a citizen her mother was a citizen mm -hmm. but Evelyn's father was not a citizen he was caught by the local authorities without the proper paperwork and he was uh, put in a detention center awaiting deportation so Evelyn's family had been torn apart because of uh, 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 an immigration law. I see. So the little girl had a t-shirt that said free my dad on it that she hand drawn with letters and I thought it was very powerful as a picture. So I went up to the mother and I said do you mind if I photograph your little girl because I think her t-shirt is a very powerful statement. The mother said sure. I pointed my camera at the little girl mm -hmm. and she did what my kids would have done. She got frightened. Who is this strange man? So she hid behind her mother's legs. Oh. Now that's not the picture I wanted to take of a frightened little girl. I wanted to photograph the girl I'd seen on the march, marching with a sense of optimism, right? And hope that her father will be released. So um, to earn the little girl's trust, I had to play balloons with her for five and a half hours. She pointed to me after all that time and she said, picture. Oh. So after I took the picture, I turned to the mother and I said, I think I've just taken one of the most important pictures of my life. So the mother turns to a little girl and the mother says, the photographer's very happy. You did good. I'm very proud of you. Mm -hmm. And the little girl turns around to her mother and she says, mommy, if I did so good, does that mean daddy can come home? I'm not, I'm not putting forward a political agenda ever in my work, mm -hmm. but it, I do care that we humanize the data so that this is not about numbers or statistics, even though it's based on fact. Yeah. What this is about is that this is a human being and all those numbers and statistics that everyone quotes all the time, they're all human beings with relationships and families just like our own. Mm -hmm. And if I can help create empathy in the world by humanizing the data, then I can help begin the process of bringing people back together. You know, Platon, I know where you are, America is struggling with so much with this domestic agenda because there are questions handed over through generations that have not been resolved and exploded. Would it be still possible for political leaders in that country to open up their hearts and look at the other questions that others have. You have politicians who think that winning means that someone else has to lose. It's not really a win if half the country lost. And right now, Trump's supporters, they've been sort of erased, right? You have absence. But absence does not mean that those feelings have gone away. No. It just means that their, their, their voices have been silenced. Meanwhile, the people who really want their voices heard, the people who are struggling, who are falling into the COVID crater, the mm -hmm. poor people, they're not getting listened to. Before we go, can you help me? How can I pose in front of Zoom with style? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. It's a combination. This thing. is this a is a big challenge. You know, I've been thinking about it for a whole year, and will I get the answer? All right. It's very simple. Okay. The lighting is really important. <laughs> the lighting should always be central and slightly above, so it carves out cheekbones, creates shadows. It's where you want them. The the other thing is you have to think of this. Uh, again, I'm going to strip it down to humanity. When you are out with a dear friend yeah. and you're having dinner with them, mm -hmm. right? And you have a, you're sitting opposite each other at yes. a table. Mm -hmm. If your friend is saying something really interesting, inspiring, and you're in, you're happy, you're probably going to lean in. Yeah. And you're going to really, with your feelings, want to reach out to that person. Now okay. that is a sign that you are filled with admiration, humility and respect, and it brings out the best in you. You have to think of the camera in Zoom as your best friend. Create a bridge between yourself and the people, whether they are really with you or through this technology. Either way, okay. we have to bridge build and come together. 
And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching.